I can actually put a piece of meat in the water if I like. You see, nothing happens, but if I drop it, watch. It'll come up and take it rather gentle because it's dead. There's no reason to kill it. The reason is that small brain on this animal makes it almost totally instinctive, which in turn makes him almost totally predictable. Drop the piece of meat again. And have a look at it. Now this one's only a four metre one. I'm going to actually stick my finger inside of his mouth for you. How would you like your finger in there? Put it in there gently, watch. Total predictability, people. There's nothing I like better than roam around the bush. When I was younger, I spent a couple of months in the rainforest being a bit of a Tarzan, living off bush tucker. When I was at Edward River, even though I took food with me everywhere I went, canned food, I never used it. I always ate bush tucker. So, just like you, I have to get away from the grind of everyday work, nine to five, playing with my little crocodiles. So I gave him that John Robbo a ring, and we're off. Hey fella, give one. Rob Breddle and John Robinson head deep into Australia's Gulf Country. There aren't a lot of people there, but there is a lot of heat, dust and distance. Rivers and creeks form lifelines between miles of hot, dry, waterless country. It's dangerous country. Even today, people still perish. But if you know a bit about the bush and are not too fussy, then this is the best place in the world. Rob Breddle knows the bush. And this will be a brief return to a lifestyle he loves. For him, it's a kind of a bush cooks tour. But for John Robinson, it'll be his first time in Queensland's deep north. You know, John, this is going to catch us to fish. You're going to catch a fish with a tree? Yeah. It's a fish poison tree. Oh, I see. When I was at Edward Drupal with the Aborigines, they used to use this wattle tree to poison little water holes of fish. You get the leaves bark and these dried up pods, crush them, then put it in the water. And it makes them come to the surface, or it destroys the oxygen of the water, I suppose, and it'll make them come up. I hope it works. Well, still the bush, man. Yeah, we'll go hungry if it don't. Hey, that's unreal. So what, is it like a detergent? The soapiness is caused by a substance in the plant sap called saponin. Geez, I'm glad it's not a big water hole. <laughs> saponin is common in many plants, including lucin. It's got a strong smell to it, Rob. Yeah. yeah it smells a bit like lucin, hay. The particular ingredients of this saponin poisons the fish by preventing its blood from absorbing the oxygen in the water. One came up. One hit the surface, mate. Well, I reckon the Aborigines would have just waited for them to come like here to the edge and they would have just speared them off. So they waiting time. So basically when they come up for air, they give them a prime shot and that's they just right. speared them. Oh, yeah. I reckon that's it. Saves a lot of waiting time. Look, there's a fish. There he is. There's one. He's come up. Look. Groups of Aborigines used to throw large quantities of leaves into sizable water holes. They had to manage this carefully because the water hole would be useless until the next wet season rains flush the creek. Bigger one? There's one just over here in front of us. Just down in here, mate. Right here. One's jumped out by himself over here. Look at that. <laughs> Leaving the bloody pool. Now they're starting to come out. What about me? Where's me barra? You said I'd have a barra for tea. <laughs> I oh, can use one of these as bait if you've got a hook. You can catch bait with a hollow log. Now, you can find them naturally in the water, or you can take them from the land and set them. Now we found one here naturally, and we're going to see if there's anything in it. Now it's a good idea to try and block off the ends with your hands and then get it out of the water very, very quickly. I 
can hear something down in here. Okay, shake him out. There he comes, there he comes, there he is. It's a prawn or freshwater shrimp. If you haven't got a fish hook, you can carve them out of wood. Now it's a good idea when you make them to leave a little lump on the end to tie your string around. If you've got a piece of wire, you can actually heat it in the fire and burn a little hole through it. it makes it more successful. Now you can't just use any sort of tree, it's got to be a very hard wood. And you take a fork like that, you don't take a thin one, you take a bit thicker one, so you carve it down to give it strength, because you want to hold that fish. Now I'll show you how to do it. A good strong one's what you want. Should have brought me a big knife. Okay, that should be enough to break it off. There we go. And before you carve too far, it's a good idea to test it to see if it's got strength. Now this one looks like it's going to break. Look at that. It's got a weakness in it. We're going to get another one. Found myself a good one this time. A bit of strength to it. Wattle. Now, I like to leave the one branch on here because it makes it easier to carve. It gives you something to hang on to. Just break it free of that branch now. There you go. Now that's a big hook, but I want to catch a big catfish. Now, with this hook, we have to bait it in a special way. In the mouth and out the bum. Now the reason I do this is so that when the fish actually swallows the bait, he must take the hook. He can't get it off easily. Tie the string around that lump that I made. I'm going to tie this end to a real springy branch so I can go away and do me other things that I have to do, like check me little logs and things. I don't have to be with it. Gotcha! Gotcha! Big catfish! This is a what they call a salmon tail catfish. They've got a very big mouth so they can swallow quite a large fish. One of the prize foods of the Aboriginals up here. Now I baited the wooden hook in a special way so when the catfish took the bait he had to swallow the hook to get the bait and that's just what he did. He swallowed it. Now he's been on it for some time so he's fairly well exhausted just like me. Gulf rivers are a bit like bush supermarkets Everyone knows if you want food, this is the best place to come. Rob Breddle has known Jimmy Kendall for more than 25 years, since they used to roam the bush chasing crocs together. His family have been fishing and caught a quite unusual lunch. They routinely hook these file snakes on fishing lines. A quick bite to the head kills the non-venomous water snakes. Then they're cooked as they have been for 40,000 years or more. The two bushmen get a lesson first-hand in the preparation of a true bush delicacy, enjoyed by Aboriginal people along the rivers and billabongs across northern Australia. Good, good. Separating the backbone removes the perfectly cooked flesh. 
Mm. Nice. Nice smoky flavour. Isn't it? Yeah. good? Yeah. Yeah, I like it. I just can't put a taste to it, that's all. <laughs> yeah, but you want to do Got a smoky flavour. Mm. Very nice. Good little tongue, yeah. Mm. Well, I suppose you want me to go up and get him, don't you? <laughs> he jumps, mate, I'll catch him. You better. I'm not going to catch you, though. You're heavy. Where is he? He's out on this end branch out this way, mate. I might have to break the branch off and just drop the branch. That was nearly got me, mate. <laughs> hey, don't break the whole tree. Yeah, hey! Got him! Got him! Got him! What a beauty! Grilled, frilled lizard would do a lot for a hungry man. But not this time. Gulf rivers are home to the fish-eating Johnston's crocodiles. For the barefoot bushmen, they're just another lizard. But for his mate Robbo, crocs are still a bit of a mystery. Over here! One over here! You sent a turtle slip off that log there. A turtle? Yeah. Do you want me to get him for you? Yeah, I don't want to get my shoes wet. I'll go get him. Nothing else in there, is there, Rob? Where is he, Rob? Somewhere in the middle there. It's a long-tailed turtle. <laughs> Good old, that's thick, isn't it? <laughs> that could have been your finger, mate. <laughs> He's a funny turtle, mate. <laughs> Think you're funny, don't you? One problem with bush tucker is it's different. It might be good for you, but the taste or the look can cause even a hungry man to falter. That's yours, that's mine. That might be enough, you reckon? Yep. The frustrating thing about freshwater mussels is they're easy to find and cook, but after that the going gets tough. Right, yeah. This would be an appetizer. So when they're cooked, they open up? Yeah, they open up. And that's when they're ready, when you flip them over? I'm going to flip them over. I want mine cooked. Oh. <laughs> I do too. Can you eat these things raw? You, they're no different to an oyster, are they? Well, they shouldn't be. And you eat oysters raw? Yeah. Have you eaten one of these raw? No, I haven't. I reckon you should try it. I reckon you should try it. <laughs> no, I You not. mentioned it. <laughs> No, I'm just curious, you know. Well, let's see. I see him as a... a I'll have a go at one raw. A freshwater oyster. Got a strong muscle on there. It's really cool muscles. <laughs> You're mm. going to eat that raw, are you? No, I don't think I'll. I think I'll have mine cooked too, mate. <laughs> Do you think we're on the wrong side of this fire? You're cooking. I just think the wind's changed. That's oh. We're on the wrong side. Oh, sizzle, sizzle, sizzle. I guess that's what they call cooked in their own juice. Like chalk and cheese, with fire, without fire. Mm. 
Now don't play with your food, John. Just eat it. Looks like an alien. <laughs> so you can eat yours and tell me what it tastes like? I thought you were going to do it first. A little bit chewy. Mm. I prefer oysters. This strange looking fish is a shovel nosed shark. It's really a ray, it's not a shark. Now, they do forage on the beach on the incoming tide. Now, you can tell him from any other sharks, this fellow has three fins sticking out the water when he comes up really shallow. Now, you might have noticed I didn't rush him, I just stood in front of him nice and gently and then pounced at the last moment. And they are good to eat. We don't need him, so I'll put him back. Get out of water for too long, did I? You'll be right. Vast numbers of plants and animals were food for Aborigines. 300 or more varieties have been recorded in the Australian bush supermarket. European supermarkets may list less than a hundred food types, but great variety doesn't always mean it's easy to get. Come on, unless you want to get eaten by the sandflies and mosquitoes, you have to do this. How's me back? It's supposed to be good for your skin too. It's just what I always wanted to do, really well. And kick crops away too. Put a bit on your face too, mate. Where's my quality of look? Nearly as pretty as me, mate. Got him. Good one. Hey Rob, get your stick, I think I've got one here. Let's see, is that one? Yep. Just pick him out there, just push him up there nice and easy. I just want to pick him up there. Just got him? Yep. Oh, it's only got one claw. You can have that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's You thought I was having yawn then, didn't you? Well, it wouldn't be the first time you made an idiot out of me. Now, when I was young, we went to Townsville to chase water mangrove goannas. Oh, the yeah. old fella there actually said, come in the mangroves, stop the sand flies and mosquitoes, put mud on. And it worked then, it works now. <laughs> The problem most of us have when we go out in the bush is we don't know what we're looking at. All we see is a forest. We train our eyes to rapidly scan things like TV commercials and advertisements to find the best place to shop. Bush people train their eyes to see the best place to hunt. They see a lot more than the forest. They see advertisements of a different type. Some people say you can hypnotise lizards by rubbing their stomach. I just think he thinks I'm King Kong that picked him up and he's playing dead. <laughs> Not yet. Now even Pooh can tell you a fair bit about what's around. You know, 
by breaking this one open, I can tell that it actually came from a snake, because with the snake, they digest the bones. If this was a cat or a fox, it would have splinters of bone in it. It has none. And the fur actually looks to me like possum fur, actually. So it tells me that the snake must have been a reasonable size, because it has to be fairly big to eat a possum. It tells me there's possums in the area, too. Now here's another sign, snake skin. Now this is an old one, you can see it's almost disintegrated. But it tells me, along with the poo, that there's a snake living here. I'll go and look around a bit more. Here's a much fresher piece, and from the way it's laying, I can tell which way he went, because it comes off like a stocking. So this snake went that away. And even from this piece of skin, I can tell you what kind of snake it was. If you look at the belly here, it's got very narrow belly scales. This came from a python. Now, I can still see some of the patterning on it, so it's a carpet python skin. And it's quite a big one too, that's just the end of his tail here. So it's quite a big one living here somewhere, and that's quite fresh. It's been shed in the last couple of days, in fact. So he can't be too far away. Now I've got to get you out. Tickle, tickle, tickle. Go on, out you go. Go on. Yeah, go on out. Go on, out you go. Gotcha. Come on, out you come. Come on. Out you come. Oh, they can pull it. That's it. Out you come. Come on. Come on. Stop tight, he is. Now we can't go off again. Go off again. This is what you call working for your food. He's coming out. He's coming out. He's coming out. What a beauty! What a beauty! If you look around places like this, in a day you should find something like this to eat. And this one will feed a family, not just me. It's a bird-eating spider, poisonous enough to worry a human and perhaps kill a dog. And yes, you can eat these. In New Guinea and Indonesia, they do. Now, in the bush, food and tools are everywhere. You just have to look. It might look like licorice. It sure doesn't smell like licorice. I gather it doesn't taste like it, but these flies reckon it does. It's possum poo, and it's fresh. So it tells me he's living in that tree. Now in this sort of an area here, if you find a hollow tree, 
you're pretty sure there's something going to be living in it. And at the base of this tree I can see some scratches. Up here I can see where he's been coming out the log over here. And right down here I can actually see where he's been leasing oil and stuff from his, and a bit of fur down there as well. So there's obviously a, a possum living in this log. To catch him, I can't put my arm down, he's probably about four or five metres down the hole. So I'm going to have to set a snare. Now it's going to be a little difficult because can't really set it there. I'm going to have to make it here and I'll have to block this log up here so I'm only going to give him one place to come out. And that makes me sure I'll catch him. Just put the snare over the hole and he has to come through here so he'll put his head through when he walks off it gives him a bit of rope and eventually he'll come to the end of it and then he will jump hook around his neck and he will virtually hang himself if you want bush tucker you got to do these things Come on, mate. We're not going to eat you. This is one of mine from the park. Now, we just wanted to show you how it actually works. I'll get it off you, mate. It works. Gotcha. <laughs> Tropical North Queensland is pig paradise. Vast areas of uninhabited country, plenty of food and water, and few predators means that the feral pig population has exploded into millions in just a few decades. Now there's a lot more to eat in the bush than before, and they're easier to catch than a kangaroo. Roaming the Gulf Country late in the dry season does have its problems. The early summer storms have turned many of the tracks into obstacle courses, hard on man and machine. Tracks become canals and potholes become bogs and the soaring temperature and humidity leave the two bushmen dreaming for air conditioning and ice. Approaching wet season high tides have begun to penetrate the coastal clay pans. In the wet season, they form impassable swamps. If you get caught here too late, it's a long walk home.
The few incidents with the vehicles make the two bushmen wonder just a little how they'd fare without transport, without shelter, and without fire. If you find yourself stranded in the bush and you have to make a camp, because shelter is very important, these cabbage tree leaves make an excellent roof. Even one be enough to shelter you from a rainstorm. He thought I couldn't see him. Now, if your eyes are sharp enough, you can find these. It's a little grasshopper that lives on the palm tree. So while you're getting your roof, you can also get a snack. And they taste pretty good. Mm. Good. One more time. Another. Good enough. This timber is too wet. See how it's sticky? Yeah. It's green. I reckon it's got to be dry, like kiln dry. Weathered in the sun. Nearly through that bit. But you can see how it works. Yeah. It definitely works. <sighs> Need dry timber, Rob. Wear my hands out before we start a fire. The old Aborigines would have tough things doing this, wouldn't they? I reckon. You know, it's probably women's jobs. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll have to settle for the raw grasshopper. I think my hands will catch fire before yeah. the stick does. <laughs> Who had it? Who said this? Where there's smoke, there's fire. Not here. Yeah. Oh! Just the amateurs, that's the only problem. I'm too old to be lost in the bush. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. An old Aboriginal friend told me that if you want to take fire from one place to another, what you do is you get a piece of a pandanus palm, a dry piece, hollow out the end, and place a hot coal in there. One or two coals and it will just smoulder away in there for hours. When you get to the new place, you just drop around on some grass and blow on it, and you've got a fire, instant. You see how it works? Just like a big cigarette. And this is a good enough spot for it. I reckon it should work. You're probably thinking, what the hell is he doing? Well, in areas like this open forest, a lot of small animals live. Now they're rats, mice, marsupials, even large skinks. If you're stuck out here, you might think, well, how am I going to catch them? Because a lot of them come out at night. Well, in the bush, materials are everywhere. And that's why I'm playing with these stones. A nice flat stone like this. I'm going to try to make a Stone Age rat trap. And this is a good enough spot for it. I reckon it should work. You're probably thinking, what the hell is he doing? Well, in areas like this open forest, a lot of small animals live. Now they're 
rats, mice, marsupials, even large skinks. If you're stuck out here, you might think, well, how am I going to catch them? Because a lot of them come out at night. Well, in the bush, materials are everywhere. And that's why I'm playing with these stones. A nice flat stone like this. I'm going to try to make a Stone Age rat trap. Now, I've never made one before. But the idea I've got, I reckon it will work. Okay, then. Now, I take me bait and put it right at the back of the rock. Now, I've got to balance the trigger like that. Now there's no way you could knock it out. So what I've done, I've designed a little roller. There it is, balanced. Now we've got to stop him from coming in from the sides. So the only place he can come in is through here. So we'll put a couple of rocks either side here. When he goes in, he will bump this little rock here. Ah, gee, that! <laughs> That's how it works. <laughs> In rocky areas like this, it's very difficult sometimes for the animals to dig holes. So they have to live in logs. And looking in here, I see some grass. Something's made a nest. It's probably a rat. So we'll just see. I'll try and catch him. I'm going to block this end off and chip through from the other end. I can see it's fairly thin on the top. It's rotted out towards the top. I can hear something. There's something in there. Ouch! Little bastard. Look at that. He bit me. I thought it was his tail. There's his tail. Got him. Come on, then bite me again. Here we are. This is an introduced rat. Now it could have just as easily been a bandicoot or some other small marsupial living in Australia and they are all good to eat. You might be horrified that somebody might eat a rat, but when you look at it, it eats the same as a chicken, grain and insects. It's just covered in fur. Now, here in Australia, we have the luxury of basically eating for pleasure. In other countries, like New Guinea, Indonesia and India, this little fellow is a part of their diet. Kentucky Rat. Bush tucker in Australia has changed a lot over the last couple of hundred years. There's a lot more of it. We brought with us the ferals. Pigs, goats, cats, rats and even toads. So if you're really serious about saving on that supermarket bill, you can. Bit small. That's a better one. Welcome to my kitchen. Today I'm going to prepare for you a bush tucker banquet. We're going to have mangrove snails, cane toad legs, fricasseed rat, nah, barbecued rat, stingray, and the specialty of it all, barramundi sausage. To do this, you have to catch a barramundi, gut him, throw the barramundi away, aha, uh -huh, and then make a sausage with his gut. 
very nutritious. With the mangrove snails, you just gently baste them in the coals. With the rat, we, we gut him, we singe him, and we skewer him, and again, gently roast him over the coals. With this little fellow here, the cane toad, is a little different. Preparation's important, because that white stuff there is in fact poison. You can't eat that. You can only eat the skinned animal. And you've got to be careful not to get any of that on the meat, otherwise it could kill you. But otherwise, they taste good. The barramundi sausage, I mean, what's in his gut we poke through his gills, comes outside, all the liver and the fat goes inside, and we've got a sausage. Yes, that's him. The stingray barb, that's the poisonous bit of the stingray. He uses it like a scorpion would zut if you stand on him. Now if you haven't got a knife, you can actually use this to gut the stingray. It's very, very sharp. Listen to that cook. What I'm doing, I'm heating up the stomach to make it easier to gut it. There we go. Let's put it back on the table, because we have to get the liver out. Stingray liver. And I just put it on a plate. <laughs> there we go. We'll just put that aside for later. Hey. Just get rid of the gut. And now I'm going to cook him. When I was working with the Aborigines in the Gulf of Carpentaria, an old fella named Stingray Barney showed me how to cook Stingray like this. And I suppose the reason they put the liver in with the meat, there's a lot of vitamins in the liver. And it's pretty hard to cook it by itself. So if they mix it with the meat, you have to wash the meat first. So I've got to, I've got to scrape all of the flesh here out. Now I've got to take this and I've got to wash it. Squeeze. Now, wash it in a bit of water here. You wash it and you squeeze it out. Really squeeze it out. Now, I don't know why they did it, they just did. Now just get a bit of that liver and they mix it in with it. Now I'll wrap it up in one of the leaves and we'll bury it in the sand and cook it. <sighs> I think me rat's a bit overdone, but still, you'll be okay.
I'll bet you're thinking, yuck, rat. Yeah, it's rat, but it's only meat. It doesn't eat anything different to a chook. And in fact, I've let them be, in fact, I've been led to believe they're very high in vitamin C. I don't need oranges, just need a rat. What I'm doing is just taking the barramundi skill and gut, and I'm turning the gut inside out. Anything that was outside the gut goes inside, and anything that was in his gut comes out. So all the liver, all the fat goes inside the sausage. Stingray fish cake. Hmm, that's quite nice. What's so good about these little shellfish is they come in their own little pots. You just have to stick them in and they cook. When they're cooked, you grab them out, smash them out, and you've got yourself some dinner. No sand even. Barramundi sausage, cooked to perfection. Doesn't taste very nice, but doesn't taste very nice, but I suppose it's very nutritious. Toad's legs. They're just another kind of frog. And if we're in France, this would cost you a lot of money. Here, it's free. Mm. Tastes a bit like rabbit. What you got to remember with the cane toad is they are poisonous. But if you skin them, they're okay. So you have to be very careful if you're going to use cane toad as part of your supermarket shopping. With holiday time running out, Rob Breddle takes his mate Robbo for a last stroll in the bush. He's got it in mind to give him a real treat. Something to remember their time together by. There's just a tinge of apprehension and he's not too sure whether he's interested in any more special trips. Ha, look at this, John. Oh, you're kidding, I'm not going through there. Imagine walking along and you go, oh, and this thing goes, falls on your bloody face. Ah! <laughs> I'm going back the other way. <laughs> there swamps, spiders, mosquitoes and crocodiles a pretty low on Robbo's list of priorities. He knows only too well that finding bush tucker entails a lot of walking. I'm wet now, aren't I? Saturday morning at the supermarket has never looked more attractive. I don't know about you, John, but I feel like eggs for breakfast. That's eggs. Stick. Yep, eggs. Sounds good to me. Okay. Just got to find the chook, eh? Out here. <laughs> so what's the stick for? Well that's for you to keep the mum off it. What you've got to do, John, is take off your shirt and tie it around that stick. Because when the mother swoops, you've got to stick it in the face. Okay. Get it to 
it, John. I'll get there. Come on, Rob. No worries, mate. Yeah, she's still here. Half a dozen, do you? Yeah, just be quick, whatever. <laughs> Now, I want my shirt back. <laughs> well, get it back. It's your shirt. <laughs> yeah, that's enough. Salt would have been better. Yeah. To survive out here in the bush, you've got to take the opportunity to get your food wherever you can, whenever you can. Just anyhow you can get it. And it's basically a dog eat dog world out here. And sometimes you don't even know if you're going to be dinner. It's tough.